Good morning. And uh, again, what a privilege it is uh, for me to be part of this uh, very important event here in an important uh, venue. And uh, uh, today we continue with uh, the theme, um, Mission Connects Us, Gold, World, Church, but two for this time. And of course, in terms of the theme, <clears throat> has been indicated already, it's um, without partnership and mission, we perish. And uh, <clears throat> as I begin to reflect on this, I realize that in fact, uh, the key text uh, for this uh, theme is in fact, uh, it comes from the Philippians, and I'm not going to read it because it is actually both, it's, it's the whole book of Philippians, if you like, chapter one to four, and it talks in terms of the concept of a partnership within there. Um, but without partnership, we perish. Uh, it's quite a claim to make. And I think part of the challenge of making such a claim is the fact that uh, there are many people who very much against the use of the term partnership. I've got many friends who are very, very anxious about the term partnership. I've got many people that are, uh, who have written books and they do not want to talk about partnership. And in fact, within uh, some context, even within the Anglican Communion, uh, within the mission department that I occupy, I found documents and documents that reflected on the word partnership. And there was a feeling that, in fact, we should be using terms like companionship rather than partnership, and a few other words to try and avoid to use partnership. And the whole reason, of course, is what most of us know, is that uh, uh, they feel there's a there suspicion of the term partnership because there's been an abuse of the term. There's been a misuse of the term. That partnership uh, ended up promoting relationships that were much more of uh, paternalistic and independence, uh, the promoted paternalistic and independence uh, kind of uh, relationships. But also that they are only about money and projects. There was very little about relationship or partnership. And so these are some of the uh, criticism, if you like, of uh, the use of the term partnership. And, and so, um, you know, what is it that is actually an issue? And I think many people have said, you know, yes, we've had mission agencies, we've had churches, we've had uh, companion links that have also abused and misused uh, the, um, the term partnership. And others have been saying, you know, that uh, we've had uh, relationships where some are seen as the suppliers on one hand, and the other side are the implementers of a program designed by the supplier uh, so that the, actually the implementation, even if the celebration of the, um, the, um, the achievements that come out of that uh, happen on both sides, but nevertheless, there was an understanding that uh, you know, there has been um, that misunderstanding or misuse of the term partnership. And so, that's the kind of uh, scenario that I, I am, we are <clears throat> confronted with. And so why should therefore, you know, it must be, must be crazy therefore for me to stand here and start claiming that um, without partnership, we perish. Um, I think uh, much say that actually what, implies, what is implied in partnership is actually that a, there is a relationship and the relationship normally with a common goal to achieve a particular task. And I also want to say that a partnership for me is not something that is just uh, designed from somewhere. It is actually very much a biblical uh, concept. But also I want to uh, also say that uh, <clears throat> it is a concept also that we see and enriched from the Trinitarian theology for those who can who have done the proper Trinitarian theology would say that in fact within the relationship of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there is an important partnership that is going in there, right from creation into redemption and sanctification. 
there is a relationship that is happening there. And therefore, if that's the case, I want to say that I think uh, instead of simply abandoning partnership, you know, more like throwing away the baby with uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, the bath water, I would say that we need to save partnership from whatever uh, misconceptions that have happened so that we can retain partnership, but we need to do so, I think, in a way that uh, he respects uh, the principles and the key principles of partnership that are biblical. And uh, <clears throat> I just flunked up there a person called Dambi Samoyo. Some of, some of us who are seated here may have read the book, may have watched the videos. If you Google today Dambi Samoyo, uh, you will see on, on YouTube, there will be many YouTube videos that will come out. And she wrote a book, Dead Ed. And you know, she received criticisms from key people around the world, uh, including Bill Gates and many others, uh, because of the uh, projection, the kind of theory that is projecting there. And Dambi Samoyo simply happens to be actually a Zambian. Um, <laughs> she happens to be a Zambian, but a Zambian, uh, a very educated uh, woman um, worked in the United, he was worked in, um, um, in the World Bank, he has worked in the IMF, so she knows what actually she's talking about. She's got incredible experience, but she has written a book, you know, Dead Ed, where she's criticized, if you like, she has critiqued uh, the kind of uh, aid and, and that aid syndrome that happens and how that uh, subjugates people rather than getting them out of, uh, out of the poverty that we otherwise supposed to do. And so I'm saying here that in fact we need to look for me when we look at the partnership, it is partnership that empowers rather than partnership that uh, disempowers others. The one that characterizes people with their positive stories and images. And I must say here that uh, they are some of the images that we have characterized people either, you know, for instance, the image of poor, we have sometimes talked about the poor people, the poor people, and the poor people. And I can tell you there is one country I know, and I'm not going to name it, but it's a country where the people in that country have got a very low self-image. And part of that low self-image is because they have been told for centuries and centuries how poor they are and how they cannot do anything for themselves. And you know, if you're telling a child you are stupid all the time, you are stupid, they will be a stupid child. But you know, that's a kind of thing, that language that sometimes is used over people, it remains and gets stuck on them. And so the question for me is that if we have to salvage our partnership, then we have to start a new way of thinking and a new way of behaving, but also the attitudes and actions um, may have to change. Otherwise, we will still be um, subject to many people who are going to claim that partnership must be not used. Uh, for, for some people, partnership is like an F word. You don't use it at all. And so we are looking at partnership that actually characterizes uh, mutual uh, interdependence. And the biblical model for me that I want to uh, share is that of the Philippian uh, uh, Paul and the Philippian um, uh, partnership. In that scripture, you need to read and spend the time when you are at home to read uh, those few chapters and you are going to find that there is within that uh, uh, passage um, a relationship that is there between Paul and the people at Philippi. And for them, that relationship is a relationship of discipleship. A relationship of discipleship in Jesus Christ. That's their primary, their primary uh, orientation of relationship is that they are disciples of Jesus Christ. And that's very central. They are disciples of Jesus Christ. And so that, therefore, what their aim is, is to save the mission of Jesus Christ, to save the mission of God. So the partnership begins in the understanding that what we are on about here, it's about saving the big picture, saving the mission of God, and saving the mission of Jesus Christ. And so there is a shared vision in that sense. And so this biblical model within the Philippines is that actually, you know, Paul set up, actually, if you like, st started this church in, at Philippi. And he started that church in Philippi, but the same church at Philippi started to support him, support him in prayer, uh, support him in, uh, in material, but also they, support him, they supported him financially. 
But the support they gave to Paul, they did not see it as their giving to Paul. They saw it as their giving to the mission of Christ, to the mission of God. That for them was very important. So that they actually took out Paul as the, the, the center of recipient of that. That the recipient of that actually, it was going to save the bigger purpose. And that is very important. <clears throat> but also within that, therefore, um, the, within that partnership, I think the understanding therefore was that uh, because they were saving the big picture, they were saving the picture which is mission, and that is what was central to them, therefore money or whatever amount that they gave, the resource that was seen, it was seen as a resource that was saving the big, the big picture of mission. And therefore the person, there was, there was nothing in terms of the superiority or inferiority between the receiver and the giver. Those kind of scenarios did not exist in that kind of relationship. And so Paul benefited a lot from that and they saw each other saving the mission of God. And I think that uh, picture of mission, that biblical picture of mission is an important picture for us to behold and to hold on to. But then we, we hear, because we hear after this, we hear uh, from a, a, an archbishop at the time was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and ABC, by the way, when you see ABC there, it's Archbishop of Canterbury. It's an abbreviation for Archbishop of Canterbury. If you come to the Anglican Communion Office and you hear people talking about ABC, we are talking about the Archbishop of Canterbury. And so Archbishop of Canterbury said these words, the church that lives to itself will die by itself. The church that lives by its, itself will die by itself. Now, he said this as a warning statement at the Toronto Congress in 1963, in, of course, the neighboring country here in Canada. And I think that statement, if we are saying that partnership, without partnership in mission, we perish, you can see how that ties in with that statement from Archbishop of Canterbury uh, Ramsey. The church that lives to itself will die by itself. Without partnership in mission, we perish. God's mission is at the very heart, or was indeed at the very heart of that Congress in Toronto. The mission was very central, just like mission was central between Paul and the Philippi Church. And so the Toronto Congress, as I want to say a little bit about it, was that it made in terms of wanting to discern the ways of working together in common discipleship. That discipleship subject is very central and very important in understanding the partnership relationship. And so the Congress therefore was a call for a responsible kind of discipleship. It was a call for mutual responsibility and interdependence, which in Christ, of course, which has been coined and was coined as MRI. So when you see MRI later on anywhere else, I mean mutual responsibility and interdependence. But it was a call to partnership. It was a call to discipleship and it was a call to partnership. And so this is actually now, as within that Toronto Congress subject, we, this is a quotation that comes from uh, one of the key leaders at the Congress, who was the Archbishop of, of Canada and the Bishop of Rupert's Land. And this is what he said. What was remarkable about the Congress Fellowship was that it challenged us to be radically honest with each other. We tried to listen through the addresses and sermons and discussions to what God is saying to the church and to the world. And you can see my underlining there. I'm underlining God, church, and world because that actually is the main theme for us here. And he continues to say, I know that for me it means that no longer can I sing of you in your small corner and, 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 and in me and, and in mine. In all I do, in the service of God, my brother is with me. Whether this brother is Asian, African, European, Australian, his needs and opportunities become one judgment upon myself. Whatever task God is calling us to, if it is yours, it is mine. And if it is mine, it is yours. We must do it together, or we be cast aside together as God in his absolute freedom goes on by other means to use his, his church in hastening his kingdom. So if we don't do it, God will pass us by as it were and continues to do his work and his mission without us. 
but the call is there, quite very clear. And so, of course, that mission is in the mission is in the world. And of course, the world, therefore, is the locus of God's love and God's mission. God so loved the world, we hear in John, chapter 3, verse 16. Uh, but it is the world with all its imperfections. It's a world with all its ugliness. It is the world with all the sin that one may want to, to see. But it is the world that in which Jesus, God, loves. And God loves that world and he sends his son. And indeed, for us, the redeemed sinners, we are a community of transforming discipleship in that very world that God has created and God loves. And then again, within the Toronto Congress, ABY, that's the Archbishop of York, at the time, Kogan, he says this, the church is not primarily a debating society, it is the body of Christ that work in God's world. The Anglican communion has its part in that work. And what type of community is this Anglican communion? What type of community is this church? Now, coming back at home where I'm coming from London Diocese, recently my own new incoming Bishop of London, uh, Sarah, said this. And what type of community should that be? One which is compassionate, kind, humble, meek, and patient. One which has clothed itself in love, which binds everything together in unity. And then she goes on to quote uh, Pope Francis. Pope Francis has said this about his vision for the church, for the Roman Catholic Church, but it will do for us too. I prefer a church that is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it has, be it has been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security. And I must say, sometimes within the Anglican communion, we want to hang to our own securities of identities. We want to hang on to those things that we want to see as what belongs to us and who we are. And we cherish that sometimes. And sometimes we cherish that at the expense of what actually the big picture of God is for us. And she went on to say, the power of the cross is in the service of others. And the power of the cross is that Jesus Christ was a revelation of God's love for his world in which God would be glorified. I pray that together we live in the service of others following the pattern of Christ. The body of Christ is the church and the body of Christ is the gathered people but also the dispersed people. And the body of Christ, of course, it's you and me, all of us here. But it's not just all of us who are here. It's many others who are not here. And it's not just about us who are Anglicans or Episcopalians. It's many other Christians out there, Christian traditions. And within that diversity of language and accents, ethnicity, tribe, re region, and nationality, denomination, and doctrine, gender, sexuality, and whatever else you might want to say about that, that is the body of Christ and that's the church that is being called to be in partnership with God's mission in the world. But it's not just in the world and partnership in the world for its sake. It's in the world because there is the power of the Holy Spirit among us and within us. It is not within our own powers. And that sometimes becomes the challenge within the mission and ministry. That we take it upon ourselves as something that is for us. But actually it is God and in this case it is the empowering of the Holy Spirit. So the body of Christ is resourced very differently. And that I think that's very important. We are resourced very differently. Resourced are in a way that others have got different gifts and others have got other gifts. Every resource, for me, I see it as God's gift to us for God's own mission. But there are times, of course, we have used our own talents and skills, but let us remember that those talents and skills are talents that God has given to us. And there are times when we can, if you want, own the kind of things that we own about ourselves, forgetting that actually we don't own ourselves, we are owned by God. And therefore, everything about us 
It's a gift that God has given, and it's a gift to be used for God's own mission. And therefore, within that, we have this imperfect, imperfect but an important uh, communion of discipleship. Communion of discipleship that has to be in mutual interdependent relationship. And I just want to give this quote which comes from Desmond Tutu. You can never say something without quoting Desmond Tutu on this kind of subject. <laughs> Desmond Susie says, we are made to live in a network of interdependence with one another, with God and with the rest of God's creation. You can see I'm underlining those elements of our theme here. There is something of one another, again, that's the church. There is something about God, there is something about the creation, and that's the world. We say in our African tradition, he says, a person is a person through other persons. A solitary human being is a contradiction in terms. A totally self-sufficient human being is ultimately subhuman. We are made for complementarity. I have gifts that you do not, and you have gifts that I do not. So we need each other to be fully human. I mean, how else, what else can you say after that kind of statement? That we need one another. We need one another because that's how God has made us. We can never be fully human without others. We can live in an isolated world somewhere, but we will never be human if we lived that. The only way we can be human is to be in relationship with others. And that is what we call Ubuntu within, for those of us who come from the southern part of Africa, Ubuntu, which is what Desmond Tutu is articulating here. And I think he goes on to say, this is also true of different nations, that one people has particular gifts, Distinct worldview, a cultural ethos, which is not necessarily superior to those of other people. It is just different and it needs to be balanced by those of other, other peoples. So we find, for instance, that Africans have a strong sense of community, of belonging, whereas Europeans in this case sometimes have a constant and strong sense of individual person. These attributes in isolation and be pushed to extremes, they have their own weaknesses. Unless you see them in relationship with the other. They are good by themselves, yes, but they're not good enough unless they are able to be complemented by the other. And so, that therefore is what is diversity. And that is the language of diversity that exists within the partnership. And within that partnership, within us, for us, is that God's gift to humanity is that we are diverse. Diversity is not a problem. And quite a lot of us who want to see diversity as a problem, yes, we may be different, but that is not a problem. But let us remember, this great nation of United States of America is known for its being great because of the diversity that it has, both in terms of its peoples, both in terms of the skills, both in terms of the, you know, the, 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 the way in which the people are resilient about everything. But it, what makes this country is the diversity that exists in this country. And you know, and I can assure you, you take that away, you take away the strengthness and the strongness of this country. And that's exactly true about any other country in the world. We are only strong the way in which we are in our diversity. You take away that, you rip it apart. But I think that's in a way that actually what has happened to the Anglican communion. We have the diversity. And sometimes, you know, history has shown that your strength is oftentimes the source of your weakness. History and life teaches us that, that the strength in you, look out for it, that will be the point of weakness. And within us, in terms of the Anglican communion, probably even within the United States of America, it is the diversity that can become in itself a weakness. But only if we give it up, only if we are willing to give it up, then it will be one which will be a weakness for us. But I think the idea, therefore, that we need to invest, <clears throat> we need to invest in that, uh, um, we need to invest in that, in that, in, that we, in, in that diversity so that it does not become a weakness. It becomes, in fact, a strength. And then, therefore, if we want to just move a little bit, I just want to check, you know, because <clears throat> while we are talking about within the diversity, there have been within the partnership, there have been some understanding uh, 
on the how we relate to one another. We heard on Wednesday from Dr. Henry, he hinted and not just hinted, but actually brought out the whole concept of missionary God. Why, who is a missionary God? And what does it mean to believe in the missionary God? And what does it mean, therefore, to be a missionary? What does it become to become a missionary? Yeah, as the missionary term become, become over, century, over, over years and years, become professionalized, that it has become a profession for the few? Do our church's structures render for receiving of missionaries? How ready are we willing? How ready are we willing to listen and indeed to learn from others? How ready are we willing and able to listen uh, to others? I'm not sure what, where we are there. <laughs> <laughs> But I think we, the missionary God, this is what Archbishop Rowan said. There are things we shall never know about Jesus Christ and the written word unless we hear from and see what they do. Can I say this again? There are things we shall never know about Jesus Christ and the written word unless we hear from and see what they do in the ever new contexts. And I think again it's hitting on that understanding of we can never know fully who God is. We can never understand fully the, um, the, the mission of God until and unless we are able to hear it from others. And so the question is, how are we willing, not just to listen, but how are we willing to receive our missionaries, as it were, from other contexts? And sometimes from the people that we have always been giving. It could be from the people that we have always been helping. The people that otherwise we have seen as the people who receive from us. How willing are we able uh, to do that? Do our structures, uh, do our structures avail us to be able uh, to do that. The fullness of the gospel cannot be fully comprehended, cannot be fully propagated as it were uh, by one church or one region, but it is one that can be comprehended and be propagated as in our participation in it through God and as partners in mission. Without partnership in mission, we perish. A totally self-sufficient human being, two to goes on, is ultimately subhuman as we had. But unless we understand that we exist for complementarity, we miss the point that in fact we are made for complementarity and that we are made to be in partnership, relationship, in order to be able to save God's mission. And so key issues in terms of partnership, as I wind, is to say uh, that the key, some of the key terms are collaboration. How are we able to collaborate? How are we able to understand that we can collaborate and learn from others? How are we able to share the common vision when we are talking about partnerships? How are we able to understand that diversity and interdependent, they go together? How are we able to understand that accountability that we talk about is actually mutual? We can talk about mutual accountability rather than accountability of only one side. Accountability must be mutual. How are we able to talk about sharing? That is not just about receiving or giving, but actually sharing. And I want to end with this story from a colleague of mine. And this is a priest who went to visit a companion link, a diocese. And at the end of the visit, he was asked by his friends. They said to him, brother, he's a brother, can you tell us one project that we be able to support in your diocese? No, in your church, in your parish. So this brother of theirs, he paused for a bit, and then after pausing for a bit, he answered, he said, I'll be very happy to uh, take that upon, to take that up. But I want to suggest something even further, that yes, I will identify a project in my area, but I may also ask you to identify a project in your area, so that your project and my project we can co-sponsor them, both of us, so that you can sponsor my project 
And, and, and also we sponsor that jointly, we can also come and sponsor your project jointly. You might want to guess the end of the story. You might want to guess the end of the story. The end of the story was basically that that project never existed because the other friends were not ready to take up the offer because they saw themselves as the only ones who were supposed to give. So that is what the challenge, those are the assumptions of partnerships that are being challenged. That in fact today, we are supposed to be partners and partners in God's mission in that sense in which we are able to share in God's mission together as a body of Christ. Thank you and God bless. John, thank you. Rich stories, good thought, and um, a lot of inspiration to think about how we, how we do partnership together with authenticity and, and joy and mutuality. And so to model that, we want you to turn to a neighbor and spend just a few minutes here in conversation with one another. What did you hear? What surprised you? Uh, what questions are you left with? Gather your initial thoughts here in this moment uh, with one other person. We'll take about 10 minutes for that. I'll let you know when you have five left to go. Um, but spend a few moments in partnership conversation about what you heard with one another. Okay, everyone, please let's give our attention now to Dr. Heaney as he has a response to Dr. Uh, Canon Kafanka's comments. Good morning, everyone. So, of course, first I want to uh, thank Canon Kafwanka for a thoughtful and challenging lecture. It's been a real joy and a blessing for me to work with John over these weeks and months as we've prepared for this conference. I think we can all see how his experience and leadership in intercultural mission and his position as director for mission at the Anglican Communion Office is crucial to our life together. Jem would do well to learn further and develop deeper relationships with key leaders in our communion like Canon Kafwanka. John and I are involved in other collaborations, and for my part at least, John, I hope this is not the last time we share a stage together. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you, John, for your important, insightful, and timely contribution this morning. So I have some brief reflections uh, that I hope will resource our conversation both here on the stage and at the tables. Canon Kafuenka lays before us the multi-directional realities not only of present day mission practices, uh, but also he points us to the rich relationship between mission discernment practice, and our vision of the missionary God. In short, what we do impacts what we think. What we think impacts what we do. And who we think with, discern with, and act with impacts the extent to which the thinking and the doing is life-giving or life-denying, or in John's words, empowering or disempowering. So what I'd like to do at this juncture is affirm the principles that John affirms, and I think these are principles that have echoed throughout this conference, and from there, I would like to push us um, a little bit more on how these principles might intersect or integrate with your work as GEM. And I hear four key principles in Canon Kafuanka's lecture. One, mission is divine in nature. He makes an appeal to Philippians. He makes an appeal to the picture of the church as the body of Christ. He makes an appeal to this picture of the missionary God. Two, 
discipleship plays a foundational part as the bedrock of missional discernment, formation, practice. Three, a critical approach to mission for groups like JAM is urgent. Four, the Anglican communion, while an imperfect gift, is nonetheless a gift. So given these four principles, let me ask some questions about how such principles might intersect with or inform your work in and as JAM. First, because mission is divine in nature, the first challenge is always a theological one. Let me put it plainly and let me put it contextually. In light of this conference and in light of the conversations you are having, to what extent can you articulate what we mean by the mission of God? If your neighbor asked you, what is mission? Can you answer the question in reference to the nature and work of God? Can you finish the sentence, mission begins with God because? If there is hesitancy, unwillingness, or an inability to talk about the divine nature of mission, then there, this is a sure sign there is something wrong with your practice of partnership. Second, because discipleship is foundational, then we need an openness both to God's grace and God's judgment. Are we prepared for that radical honesty John talked about? John identified the dangers of paternalism, dependence, and the continuation of colonial attitudes and practices. Even by the law of averages, let alone in light of mission history, there will be attitudes in practices and practices in this room that correlate with John's criticisms. As Jem, what practical measures are you going to identify and build in that will provide a way for intercultural accountability? How will you know when you are doing it wrong? Who will tell you? How will you receive such news? What principles will you apply? What resources will you share? Third, because a critical approach to mission is needed, we need to own up and always be alert to the gap between our rhetoric and reality. John Barnes wrote a book published in 2013 called Power and Partnership, A History of the Modern Missionary Movement. And as he plots the rhetoric of the modern missionary movement for greater mutuality and partnership, he calls the reader back again and again to what he calls the gap between rhetoric and reality. What we say often does not impact what we do. And what we do seldom is interrupted by fresh theological insight and a genuine discerning of God's mission in God's world. Will you, therefore, commit to reading together, praying together, meeting together, to be nourished by a range of sources and voices that can renew an Episcopalian vision for the mission of God. Fourth, and lastly, because the Anglican communion is a gift of diverse contexts and voices, it opens us up to God's call for intercultural witness and fellowship. It is, the communion is, testimony to our sure, shared humanity 
and the oneness won for us by Christ. It is a gift, and if it is so important, what voices from beyond the dominant culture will Jem invite to hear from and partner with as it moves forward? How do you plan to receive from the communion, and how does such reception impact your witness in your neighbor, in your neighborhood, which is also always part of the communion and part of what it means for mission to be global. Indeed, do we even need the G in jam at all? So these are my initial thoughts and reflections on Canon Kampfwanke's important lecture. I hope they're useful to our ongoing conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we know you had some robust conversation about this at your tables. Um, in just a minute, we'll invite some responses to these questions about examples of, of vital and viable mission partnerships, challenging mission partnerships, uh, ways we've received gifts from one another. Um, but to begin, we've been so blessed throughout this conference simply to be at Virginia Theological Seminary and to have this conference take place in a learning environment. That contributes um, a lot to what we're learning and doing together. Um, and so to get our conversation started, we want to have a student speak a bit, um, Leon Sampson. I, and where is Hartley? Hartley, if you could get the microphone to Leon. And in just about two or three minutes, if you could share your mission story, John um, wanted the group to be able to hear a bit of your witness and example. I can speak out too. I can proclaim the gospel so I can speak out loud up around the church. <laughs> um, my name is Leon Sampson. I'm a seminarian here uh, my second year but I'm also an uh, ordained deacon out of Navajo Land Area Mission. And the story I wanted to uh, uh, reiterate with uh, the, the canon here was talking about was the idea of mission and the necessity of having mission partners. Uh, Navajo Land Area Mission history has brought us to a time where the Navajo people were subjugated to policies from the government. And so through the churches, the government has had this race way to... Um, uh, implement some of those policies, and so mission uh, evangelism became a dirty word among, among our people. And so, how do we come from that? Well, if it wasn't for mission partners and lifetime mission partners, I know on your table you see short-term mission and long-term mission. We both have that mentality in mission partners today. Uh, so, with the mission mentality coming out and evangelizing and being part of the community was very important because in my context, we were part of a, in, in our area in Utah, that's where I come from, uh, our Navajo people didn't have services uh, that were available to them, social services uh, that were probably education facilities that were 50 miles away and people just weren't able to travel that way. So partners like Baxter H. Liebler that came from Connecticut came out with the mission mentality of establishing a mission church, which allowed a schoolhouse, a dormitory, vocational schools, a health clinic, and these are social services that were very much needed within the community. So the idea of services were part of the mission group. Well, nowadays, the context is a little different. We have a town next to us that has established a lot of Indian health services, education facilities, uh, social service uh, outreach, and so our mission Church itself looks a little different, and we have separate challenges with that. We have still had some mission partnerships that come out and evangelize and just basically said, here, these are stuff that we don't need. You can have them knowing, thinking that we would need 20 bags of clothes. Well, not necessarily, you know. Well, we start to look at visioning how can we make that more effective within the community. And it starts with someone who understands the community itself. And so I become that point person in that area where we start to talk to our mission partners to say, well, how can we be more effective when you come out to mission partners? 
So uh, being more effective, uh, teaching, uh, supporting the vision of the community was one part. The second piece that we have to deal with is being a mission church itself. So being a mission church in the community has always been the view of a provider for the community. Well, some communities come out and they ask, ask us for things. Well, I need my, some gas money. Can you help me out? Right? So then it becomes a pattern, an enabler for the community. So as new members of the community and leadership way, we have to start changing that mentality from the enabler to a self-determined, like we were talking about here. So we start to say maybe, <laughs> if, you, if you want $20, can you come out and maybe help us with cleaning the church? So there's an investment with that. And so now we still have some Anglo partners that come out and just give until their discretion is gone. And we're trying to change that mentality to the community to say, let's be inclusive with the church opposed to being an enabler to say, what is the vision that we want to do and work, walk this journey together? So those are coming to some of the commentaries I wanted to just express today. Thank Leon, you. thank you so much. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but um, yeah, thank you. Every time I've heard us talk about um, good practices related to global mission, I'm thinking about what's happening in my local congregation, that the, the two really do inform one another, so thank you for that. We would like to start with this first question and, and hear just a bit of your conversations around your tables. Titus is going to ring the bell at one minute. We have just one minute for a quick story. Um, who would like to share a story about a mission, companionship, or partnership that's viable and credible? Who had a story to tell about that? Yes, Ted. Let Hartley bring the microphone to you. Don't start. Don't, yes, I was going to say, don't start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It starts once you get the microphone. <laughs> Time's up. All right. Um, I shared a story about another parish, not one that's my own. And this parish had developed a relationship with a community in Honduras. And they went down to Honduras as a mission team to build a clinic. And when they got there, the community, since they'd had this relationship, the community was honest with them and said, look, we know you came to build a clinic and you wanted to build a clinic, but we really don't need a clinic. Mm -hmm. What we need is water, and it's about two miles that way. Mm -hmm. And the community said, well, we don't have a clue how to do a water project. Mm -hmm. And the locals said, but we do, oh. and we need your help. Yeah. And so they took the leap of faith, yeah. and they jumped into this water project and did their thing. Yeah. And... As, as the priest, as he was preaching on this, as he shared, um, his words were, faith happened and water came out at the tap. <laughs> wow, wow. Beautiful. Thank you, Ted. Is there another story of a viable, uh, mutually enriching partnership someone would like to share? Oh, well, let's move on to the... Oh, okay, yes. Yes, Margaret. Uh, Hartley's bringing you the microphone. I'll just say they spent four hours on it yesterday, and I'm going to try to do one minute. But um, yeah. but the Ohio, <clears throat> excuse me, the Science Success Program, and we were talking about it over the break. And um, part of it is that it was a long-term investment, yeah. um, and how much building trust was a piece of that. So, like I said. There's lots more to say about that, yeah, but it's just yeah, a great beautiful. project. So. That is, if you didn't get to that workshop, it's a beautiful story. Grab them before they leave and, and hear more about that. Um, what about a story about a pitfall, a, um, an experience that, that led to some um, dependence, paternalistic relationship? Does anyone have a story they want to say about that? It's part of that radical honesty um, that we've talked about earlier. Where you've experienced a challenge, um, not, not intending, you know, unintentionally fallen into that pattern. Jim? Oh, Matt? Go ahead. Matt and then Jim. With the Science Success Program, when we developed another piece where we wanted um, to ask my parish back in Ohio if they'd be willing to do a small program where the teachers in Belize could, with our program, ask for $200 to write a grant and then use those materials in their classroom. When I went back um, and started that meeting with them, a couple of the prisoners in the group were saying, why can't we just send them the money? And I was thinking, okay, why not? So, and, and I know all the reasons why not and why that's not going to work, but I turned it back to them and said, that is a wonderful question. 
Why can't we just send the money? Yeah. They gave me all the reasons of why that wouldn't work. So I am, that was able to empower them to come with the answer to their own question and then switch it around and say, if that's not going to work, then what will work? And the partnership came up. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Always teaching, aren't you? <laughs> All right, Jim, another example. I've been uh, paying attention to the Maasai Girls Lutheran Secondary School in Monduli, Tanzania for 20 years. And... That was started, you know, even before 20 years ago, uh, by an American woman who was the headmaster for a number of years, and then it had local leadership, but leadership that was uh, compromised in significant ways. Don't have time to talk about that. But what's happened over the time is uh, the initial faculty were practically all non-Ma speaking. Ma is the language of the Maasai. And, uh, they have been able to raise up their own teachers now who've been able to go, to go to university, come back, or teachers' colleges, and uh, become more in charge and more in control. And just the basic ideas, you often have to start out with a fairly paternalistic situation, and with time and with education, it gradually changes. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and this last question, um, just an experience, a story about when, um, when you've received a gift that you weren't expecting or um, some kind of gift that's come out of a mission experience that's beyond money, um, but this kind of sharing and value and participation. One of the more memorable stories I heard from my Presbyterian students at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary was of a woman who had been very uh, active in Presbyterian church women. And she related how for years a particular group of Presbyterian church women in the United States had been sending uh, bandages to a hospital in Malawi or to a church in Malawi to, make, to use as bandages. And they did this for years and they did it by tearing up sheets and then sending the strips to Malawi. After about 15 years, they all got together. And the Malawian women said, thank you so much for sending us those, but we didn't need the bandages. We stitched them together because we needed sheets. Oh. <laughs> now, what was remarkable and beautiful about that was they, they said it without criticism. They said it, they didn't want to offend the American Presbyterian women. And, and, and the relationship survived that. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Did you have a story of a gift? A story of a gift that's come out of mission relationship? Um, well, let me, let me turn to the two of you and just ask you all, um, John and Robert, a couple of questions that came to mind through your, through your comments and the response. And, um, and again, thank you just so much for sharing your insight and history of scholarship and experience around the world with us. It's been a real privilege to get to listen in on your mind for these couple of days. Um, I want to take off a bit on something that Jim said, that, um, that relationships often start one way and then sort of end up in another direction. And it, you know, it, even God's mission to us had to start somehow, that God initiated mission to the world in creation, God initiated mission to the world in the incarnation. <laughs> So how do we initiate these mission relationships in a godlike kind of way so that we get to this, this goal where we want to be of mutual, you know, mutuality in the relationship uh, more quickly than not? How do we initiate relationship in a godlike way? John, would you like to respond? <clears throat> um, my, okay. Well, I thank you for, for, that, for, for the question, but um, I think the, there is no one way of initiating a relationship. I mean, uh, the, uh, some of the relationships that exist at the moment within the Anglican Communion uh, here in the dioceses here and with other dioceses, uh, some were planned. Probably there was a committee that met and said we want a relationship to, to, to develop and uh, possibly approached someone and, and then said, you know, we want to, have a, uh, to, want to know more about your ministry, your mission, and what you're, going, what you're doing. 
and, and, and also that you can learn more about us, and so we, we can, uh, there are some relationships like that, but uh, quite a lot of relationships that I know have often begun when people meet in various locations for various reasons, and some of which are not necessarily planned that they're going to meet that person. Um, I mean, let me just give an example, some of the examples. For instance, um, yes, some are organized, but not necessarily that you organize that you meet that one. Such as um, some of the meetings that take place within the Anglican Communion, we have uh, meetings such as Lambeth Conferences and things like that, where meet, leaders meet, and oftentimes when they meet, they start talking, they meet on the tables like this, they're talking, and then they, they realize they are learning something about, uh, about another, and they realize, oh, I think they, they just, you know, the relationship just begins and they gel out of uh, an interaction that begins. And out of that, uh, before you know it, it's a relationship not just between one and one, but actually they are saying, you know, why don't we you know, enlarge this to our churches so that we can invite you to come, and you know, it begins like by invitation. Mm. Why don't you come and visit us where we are? And then, you know, another person will say, oh, you vi we, I, we visited you, why don't you come and see us as well? And, you know, with it, before you know it, it's become a relationship more than just between one person and the other. It has become a relationship more than between a parish. It has become a relationship now between, you know, it's, it's a diocese that now is all involved. Um, I think the, um, for me, part of the key thing about it all is that, first and foremost, that we are disciples of Jesus Christ. And that within that, um, within that family, uh, we have opportunities to meet and we have opportunities to communicate. And so it becomes a natural thing for us to be able to connect and to connect up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think the need becomes about what is it that we want to learn from our colleagues. I mean, some of the relationship have begun some because we have struggled. We have struggled on one side. Mm -hmm. You know, we are struggling with the youth ministry. We are struggling with something. We want to hear something about how others yeah. are doing it on yeah. the other end. Yeah. So sometimes it will be a situation at, 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 at home that may trigger for someone to want to have a relationship. And other times are simply those relationships that come. Yeah, um, so, that, so invitation and then recognition of, of mutual experiences and places where we share. Yeah. Um, you have any thoughts about that? How we initiate relationship in a godlike way? I, I, um, let me say some obvious things. For, um, pray for the world. Uh, when you're planning your liturgies and those prayers for the people, that takes work. Mm -hmm. But often we don't do very much work mm -hmm. in doing it. Um, the old-fashioned prayer meeting, I think, is a bit out of vogue now. Um, but praying together for the world is a good place to start. I think um, reading more about the world. We'll talk about formation maybe later yeah, and yeah, yeah. specific uh, books even. I think learn more and deepen your presence as disciples in your own community. And there will be intercultural, global, international connections right on your doorstep. Mm -hmm. So right here at VTS, we're working on uh, particular uh, partnerships right now, all of which emerge from relationships here uh, mm -hmm. at the seminary because we have students from Tanzania or Liberia or the Middle East mm -hmm. and from those local connections mm -hmm. and local presences um, projects uh, emerge and then connect with the communion right mm -hmm. connect with the ACO connect with the resources um, they're putting out there I think those are for me very practical simple steps okay. um, that we can take locally um, to follow up on that a little bit, let's, let's think for a minute about, about the spiritual practices that are behind, um, that salvage partnership, to use your language, that we're hoping to, to salvage that concept of partnership and not have it devolve into a, a paternalistic, um, non-mutual sort of relationship. And it occurs to me that that really is spiritual work. You've shared with us about developing an expansive theology of mission, and, and that's, that's spiritual formation work, really. And so what are some, you've, you've mentioned prayer, what are some other practices for ourselves as individuals and in congregations and in the groups with whom we work that, that can expand that vision and help us develop good partnership? Some of this may sound like bad news, but I guess one of my first things would be to say, turn off Netflix, turn off Amazon, turn off the TV, and pick yeah. up a book. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Might be the first thing to do. Um, 
I, you know, a, a bunch of books come, come to mind, some of which are really accessible but really useful. Um, books are on cultural intelligence uh, is really good. There's a book we use sometimes with students written by a scholar uh, called Ra. Uh, I think Jehu Hanseel's book, Beyond Christendom, is worth uh, reading. Anything by Titus is worth <laughs> reading. Um, that book, we've already talked about, the Howell book on short-term mission. If any of you are involved in short-term mission, you, it, it, it is God's word to you today to pick up that book and read it. It's called short, Short-Term Mission. He is an anthropologist and uh, takes uh, a look at his experience. And then the, the, the book with the best title so far this year is written by a Native American Christian theologian called Richard Twiss, and the book's title is Rescuing the Gospel from the Cowboys. Oh. Rescuing the Gospel from the Cowboys. So I think you've got to read. Um, and um, I can talk a little bit, maybe it's John's turn, a little bit more about spiritual exercises we might want to enter into and um, partnerships. Let's, but yes, I'll, let's, I'll stop. let's turn. Um, so some spiritual exercises that help us enter into mutual partnership and that salvage partnership. Um, yes, but I, I think uh, uh, some of some of uh, some of what my I think I want to go back a little bit in terms of uh, our personal encounters mm. um, and experience. Mm -hmm. We uh, cannot talk about a relationship if there is no um, you know, there is no encounter. So we need to encounter one another, and I think that's very important. And some of the ways in which we, in, in the encountering of one another, it's also where we, we, we start growing and learning, and uh, learning about, not just about each other as individual, but in terms of their own spirituality and how we can uh, harness and learn from some of their own spirituality and, and indeed share ours. Uh, I mean, I, just thinking in terms of one of the things I think I mentioned probably when we sat on the table, is uh, some of the companion links do this. Uh, I know certainly in terms of Chelmsford Diocese in England, linked with uh, several dioceses, about three dioceses in Kenya, okay. uh, what they do is that every student of, every student who is studying for full-time ministry, uh, they have to spend about six months in Kenya. It is, it's, it's compulsory for them, it's compulsory. Yeah. They, uh, it's, part of, it's part of the curriculum, yeah. if you like. Wow. So, and, and, and in, in so doing, um, I think it's not just salvaging, the, the, but also there is, there is learning that is going on, but also they bring a lot of experience, and vice versa, the other students also come on the other side, and they spend time, not just in parishes, but also actually in college as well. So they spend some time in college, in learning, and also experience within that. So there is a, there, you know, there, so it's not just those who get enriched by that, mm -hmm. but actually when they get back also they get, you know, they, they bring that richness. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there is something about sharing of spirituality within there, but also there is something about investing, mm -hmm. if you like, mm -hmm. um, in that, um, in, 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 in investing in, 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 in risking that, that partnership we're talking yeah, about. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do any of you have any questions for our presenters? It's an opportunity to pick, pick their brains a little bit. Hartley, yes. Uh, let, let Hartley bring you the microphone, sorry, so we can all hear. What can I do in five minutes a day to help my spirit? Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll start with you. <laughs> um, I would say, uh, why don't you engage some art and poetry beyond your own culture? Mm. Why don't you read uh, five pages of one of the books mm. we've read, uh, we've talked about, and get your hands on the five marks of love mm. resource that Virginia, along with the SSJE, produced last mm. Lent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. John, five minutes a day. Um, 
it's, it's, it's similar, I think, on, on, on Robert's line. I think uh, there's, there's quite a lot of resource that uh, we, we do have from the side of the Anglican Communion that uh, you can, we can look at or read, including Bible study resources, particularly, that have been produced from <laughs> churches across the globe, which we gather on one section. Um, and I think if you, for me, I was going to be tempted to talk about, about a Bible, but in this case, actually, you know, something uh, that is a reflection by another context somewhere, uh, which is like in the Bible study I'm talking about, there are various reflections. Very recently, the uh, Caribbean, the Jamaican, Dallas in Jamaica, they produced a very, very good resource uh, during Lent time, which we shared, and many people downloaded that resource across the Anglican community because they found it very, very powerful and very helpful. Mm -hmm. So there, you know, mm -hmm. some of that, I think, for me, I would, I would want to deal, dwell into that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Yes, over there to Dory. When you mentioned art and poetry, it just made me think of how wonderful it would be if when partnerships either were being established or afterwards, that we could share amongst each other what, you know, like what is, if you had a student group, you know, and coming in, what art should they mm -hmm. see that mm -hmm. really communicates? Art and poetry, like you said, mm -hmm. really communicate the spirit of a culture. And if that could be shared beforehand, mm -hmm. and then the same thing, vice versa, it could go both ways. Mm -hmm. Like yeah. if you want to know about my culture, what's the one poem you should read? Yeah. Or yeah. what's the one piece of art you could see and then have a dialogue now with Skype and internet and you know there's yeah. so many ways to communicate. I think that would be yeah, awesome. That's, a, that's just, an exciting idea, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Another question, is that Molly? Not so much a question, but another quick suggestion of what you can do in five minutes a day. You can visit the Center for Anglican Communion Studies Facebook page <laughs> where we post yes. articles from all over the Anglican Communion. So every day there is a new news article from a different part of the world. You could read that article and you could say a prayer for that small piece oh. of the globe. And please do like us on Facebook because we're about 25 likes away from our goal for the 20th anniversary. <laughs> uh, there are more than 25 people in the room, so right. I think we can get you there today. Yes, Titus, do you have a question? <laughs> First a comment and then a question. I was struck, John, by your quotation from Rowan Williams about no part of the world comprehends the whole of the gospel. Mm. And it, rem it reminded me of a statement by Max Warren, mm. who was general secretary of the Church Missionary Society yeah. from the late 40s into the early 60s. A very memorable quote that we used for years at the Episcopal Divinity School in our mission program there. It takes the whole world to know the whole gospel. Um. I'll say that again. It takes the whole world to know the whole gospel. My question has to do with John's plenary presentation about partnership and companionship. And as you pointed out, John, there have been these critiques of the, the connotation, shall we put it, the contemporary connotations <coughs> of partnership as distinguished from the Philippian vision of partnership that, that, that Paul puts forward. And as you know, the companion, the, 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 the diocesan link initiative in the Anglican communion has always been called the companion diocese program rather than the partner diocese program. And then the, the mission commission of the Anglican communion in 1999 suggested moving from partnership to companionship. And yet at the same time, I think your argument about salvaging the concept of partnership is, is, is very helpful. And I wonder whether a way to salvage partnership is through the concept of companionship, which does seem to have a more relational focus. And, and here in GEM, we've been talking a lot about companionship. And I'm wondering whether it seems viable to you to, 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 to let the notion of companionship be a, an entry point as people then move towards more 
perhaps more formal <coughs> partnerships around projects. But one of the things we've been stressing is, is not going into a relationship with any projects in mind, but simply that, that relationship of, of companionship, or as the Lutherans put it and the Roman Catholics, accompaniment mm -hmm. as a paradigm for mission. John, any thoughts about that? Thank you, Titus. You always ask uh, very searching questions, Titus. Um, I, I think maybe my beginning would be that uh, um, what may not matter much probably is not necessarily so much of the concept, word, or term that we use, um, but much more the practice that comes out of it. Because, um, and I agree what you've said, but at the end of the day, uh, there are many thoughts that can one point out into companionship. Um, that which does not reflect the spirit out of which the word or the term was used. So to the point that the pitfalls that were seen in partnership are the same pitfalls that actually you find in companionship. So um, I think at the end of the day, and I agree totally with you, we need to announce that, and you know, it's uh, the companionship, it's about um, you know, journeying together, moving together, it's, you know. But at the end of the day, uh, I think the challenge for me comes about, does this reflect what actually we speak about? In practice, does this reflect the, you know, the ethos of this? Um, and I think for me, if it does, uh, I that's, I, I, I would say, Praise the Lord for that. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be necessarily sitting here or standing here wanting simply to champion the partnership as the only way one would describe a relationship. I wouldn't like to do that. Uh, but I, part of my thesis is to point out that actually it is the experience, it is the people's relationship with one another the way and the attitudes and actions which created the thought in the partnership, which has the same potential to do the same with companionship. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, one last question. Um, what are both of you reading? You mentioned a few things that you're reading, but um, what, and would someone please write down this list for me so I can get it later? Uh, but just some things that you think we should be, be reading in order to expand our understanding of of mission and, um, and to see the gospel in the whole world. Um, what do you recommend, John? Uh, I mean, there, is, uh, there, are, there are lots of books to read. Uh, I mean, one very easy to read, um, almost like a booklet. It's uh, actually print, printed in a sort of four, uh, A4 size pay, booklet. <laughs> um, it's a booklet which has been produced within the Church of England um, over a period of reflection on what companionship and partnership is about. Um, and it is, it is called uh, World, World Shaped Mission. World Shaped Mission. World Shaped Mission. Yeah, World Shaped Mission. Um, it's, a, it's an easy book, but actually it has reflected quite a lot on the challenges, the pitfalls, the issues, and various other things. And it's an easy book to read. It's uh, got questions to reflect on as well. Um, and it, you, know, you can actually pro produce a presentation if you wanted out of that kind of booklet. It's, it's easy. The VTS have just ordered a copy while I've been here, and so there is a copy now here for VTS in the library. Mm -hmm. um, you can certainly order it. I think it should be available. I'm not sure on Amazon, but certainly it is sold within the Church House bookshop and uh, can be ordered online. Okay. Uh, it is certainly one copy. Sorry? Who's the author? Uh, the author is Janice Price, um, and of course with the group and in which I'm part of that, I'm part of that group. So it's Janice Price and the group, but it's Janice Price. If you put okay. Janice Price, that will be the person. Well, okay. World Shape Mission. <clears throat> World Shape Mission. Anything else you want to add to our reading list? Of, and we can email you a reading list if you uh -huh. get, get all of that. Might okay. be the yeah. easiest thing. I think I've mentioned a bunch of books right now. Let me also point you to the Church Mission 
Society in the UK. Yeah. They have just done a bunch of videos, short little videos that, would, that are really um, good, short, might be helpful. So um, mm -hmm. Google Church Mission Society and look at the videos they've done. Um, yeah, I could list a whole bunch. Um, the Good Hue book, Growth and Decline in the Anglican Communion, is interesting. And also, uh, of course, books are being written as we speak. I'm finishing a book which will be out this year called Finding God and Each Other Amidst the Hate. Mm. So have a look for that. Mm. John and I are editing with someone else a book uh, called God's Church for God's World. Um, and basically that book is a collection of essays written from, written each chapter written by two people from different cultural contexts. Really asking the question, is it possible to do partnership across theological divides and argument and opposition? To what extent might we think about companionship or partnership? It has the added benefit, of course, of also being the title and theme for the Lambeth Conference 2020, oh. which is um, God's Church for God's World. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. Neither no. of those books are out yet, but keep an eye on, watch that, for uh, them. on that. Yeah. Okay, very good. Um, thank you both very much for fruitful conversation and an inspiring discussion. And, and just thank you very much for being part of this conference. And uh, let's give a round of applause to Robert and John for... I, um, I do want to share just a challenge and a thought with us before David comes to close out the conference. Um, Dr. Heaney, you gave us uh, four good questions for Jim to think about as we shape the work of this network. And I think in many ways they are good questions for us as individual disciples of Jesus and in our own, in our own parish and mission communities. So I just want to repeat those. Um, the first is, can you articulate a mission of God? You know, to give some thought to that, so think about for ourselves, how do we articulate what God is doing in the world and how we participate in that, that our, our thinking will shape our actions and our actions will shape our thinking. Um, the second is the question of discipleship, um, an openness to God's grace and God's judgment. Uh, where are we living into the vision of the God that we profess and where are we falling short of that and to pay attention to that in our own lives? Um, the third is to take a critical approach, um, to be alert to the gap between what we say and what we do. I'm thinking about that in my own parish life. How can we acknowledge that gap and, and talk openly about that and be open to um, hearing that? And how will we know when we're falling short? Who will, who will tell us that? Um, and then the, the final is to, to pay attention to intercultural voices, um, to pay attention to the world around us and the voices of the world around us so that our discipleship is being shaped by um, followers of Jesus throughout the world. That that's, that's a gift not only of the Ang Anglican communion, but really of the body of Christ and the, the Catholic Church, um, that we are part of something much bigger than ourselves. And so we lose out if we don't pay attention to that. So um, thank you all very, very much.